Ford Misfire Monitor. The PCM uses the crankshaft position sensor to calculate crankshaft rotational speed for each cylinder firing event. If a misfire occurs, the crankshaft slows down between the firings. The PCM knows which cylinder is attempting to fire by use of the crank and cam together and can identify and set misfire codes. Now, GM and Chrysler have their misfire data in Mode 1 under normal scan data. GM has current misfire and misfire history, which we find one of the most useful formats we've ever seen. Chrysler has running counts. We find that grafting the counting is a get a good visual on Chrysler misfires. And we're going to use Ford to bring Mode 6 and misfire together. All the techniques we're going to use for diagnosing a Ford misfire will apply to any vehicle. Just as well to a GM or Chrysler, we would get our misfire information from a different source. First of all, let's talk and review a little bit about we're going to need a crank and a cam. Now, what you see on our scope here, we have two engine revolutions to get the full cam signal. There's 36 events on the crank, but it takes 720 degrees of rotation to get full cycle, both crank, compression, and exhaust strokes on all cylinders. That's where the cam comes into play, and you see we have magnetic pickup on both of these. Now, one of the things we've exaggerated is we exaggerated the difference between a misfire. This is so we can see it. One of the things we think you should be looking for is look at this pattern like this and look for nervousness in these signals. We'll talk more about that later. Now, let's talk about the Ford's misfires. It uses two misfire algorithms to count misfires, a 200 count, short to 200 rev, and a 1,000 RPM counter. If the misfire is severe enough to cause a catalyst damage, the PCM will flash the mill, and that's detected by the 200 count. But diagnostically, it doesn't matter if the, the, the mill is flashing or steady, or even intermittent, or even if you don't have a mill, but mode 6 shows some failures. We've got to look at the root cause of failures. Now this is mode 6 data for Ford in Misfire. We're going to talk about all the different data we have here so you'll be able to identify what's going on. We, know, we also know that when things are bad they're going to be flagged in this particular scan tool by red and yellow. We have nothing out of range. Notice MIP-53 component ID 3 has 81 counts. That's a count. In reality, if you look at it a little more detail, you'll find that the limit on that particular thing is 15,616 counts. So we're way under 100, and we could have almost 16,000 counts before we'd set a code. Nothing drastically wrong, but you do have something going on on cylinder 3 that's not happening on other cylinders. Use this for intermittent data. But let's look at the causes of misfire. We have secondary and primary ignition causes. We've got fuel control, fuel delivery, intake engine, mechanical, and intake sealing. Do we have vacuum leaks? Do we have proper valve actions? Do we have head gaskets? Do we have EGR that's leaking? This is among a number of things. We're going to try to identify as many of these as possible in the shortest amount of time. Now, here's the criteria for what we're doing. We're going to use some advanced diagnostics. Yes, we're going to use a DSO, Digital Storage Oscilloscope, and we'll show you why. We're going to go back and use our Explorer case study. Customer state the vehicle drives bad. Test drive revealed it has an engine miss. There is no mill. One of those nightmares. Why can't I get a check engine light? Why can't I get a code? Scan data shows slightly elevated long-term fuel trim. Only up about 9%. A little ways, but not excessive. Here is the data, just so you can see. We have no codes, no pending codes. Here's our mode 6. 
Mode 6 does show us some failures. Now we've highlighted the misfires down here at the bottom. We will talk more about TID 21 and TID 41 later on. But for right now, we want to focus on misfires. Let's see what we can determine from this. We have a big failure in TID 56. When we look up TID 56, we find that Ford has recently clarified TID 56 as the count of events needed to learn the crank profile. What does this mean? Well, a TID 56 failure will block misfire monitors. Oh, oh. Vibrations in driveline components can cause the counts to be high. Anything, a bearing, a bushing, seal, whatever, can cause any kind of vibration in the driveline, can cause this signal to be higher than normal. And, of course, the most obvious thing is a lot of noise in the crankshaft pickup signal will cause it to be high. So it's the highest misfire rate with emission threshold limits for the 1,000 rev counter. This is the account of the attempts to identify deacceleration of the crank signal to compute misfire rates. We can explain it as a type of error count. If the errors are too high, the PCM will not be able to learn the crank profile. It's that simple. TID 54 does the same thing, has high counts as well, but not enough to fail yet. It's the 200 rev counter, and it's the short counter. It's limited to 200 counts, and it's used for excessive misfires. So we can get enough information in short times to do a short range 200 rev counter, but not enough for a long one. Now we have a small miscount count in, in Cylinder number five. If we look at 53, which is our misfires, and we go under SID five, which is the cylinder number, we have in 81 a small number of counts. We're allowed 22,784. We're only showing 81. But remember, because we have a 56, we're not doing long-term counts. We're only doing 200 rev counts. So this is an exceptionally different situation. We have an EVAP problem. Okay, we can be perfectly sure that the EVAP is not going to cause a code. We've checked it out enough. And we have a DPFE or EGR problem. And we've verified it's not a leaking EGR. So for the time being, we're going to let those die because we saw those at other places in this program. We're going to focus on misfires. So here's where we start. We know we've got a misfire on number five. We need to find out why. The DP and EVAP need to be tested as well, but they're not, we've already proven in other testing, they're not going to be part of this. Now you can start somewhere. You can start with scan data. You can start with fuel pressure, fuel delivery. You can start injector balance testing. Is the pressure drop the same? Well, we can get very elaborate with this and spend an hour or two. Uh, we can do current ramping in the injectors and the DIS. We can start some engine mechanical testing. We could easily spend a great deal of time, but we told you in the beginning we have an objective. The objective is to get to the shortest possible diagnostic that will check as much of this as we can possibly check without wasting a lot of time in doing unnecessary testing. I'm a big believer in using the secondary waveform or primary waveform, whichever is available, to help diagnose some of these problems we're seeing on vehicles. Now we're going to diagnose this problem vehicle. This is off our case study we just looked at. It has no codes, has a misfire, can't find out why. But before we get into this, let's go study the individual parts that make up this complex signal with one cylinder at a time. Start with, let's talk about the voltage spike. Now keep in mind as you look across here from left to right, that's time. Time is moving across the screen. This is set up for 25,000 volts on the top end of the scale on this particular lab scope. So we're running about uh, 17,000 volts now, right now as we, we look at this. It should not be over 20, and it should be even on all cylinders. This is the spark, or the voltage required, 
to start a spark. That's an important point. Once the spark starts, resistance causes the voltage to drop. This very high resistance in the secondary windings of the coil. It can support only a limited amount of current flow. So as soon as we have current flow, the voltage comes down. The voltage is always determined by circuit resistance. Let's say that again. The voltage is always determined by circuit resistance. Let's go look some more about this spark. Higher than normal voltage spikes can be caused by lean fuel mixtures, high resistance in plug wires, and worn spark plugs. What are we saying? Lean fuel mixtures have high resistance. High resistance in wires have high resistance. Worn spark plugs have wide gap, which under compression relates to high resistance. This one is approaching 25,000 volts, much higher than the last one we just looked at. But the maximum voltage that can be, can be limited by the maximum available voltage if the primary current is low or the coil is bad. It may be that we can only turn out 25,000 volts is the max voltage we can put out. How do we determine that? Well, the maximum voltage is the voltage that results when there is no spark to limit the voltage increase. When there's no spark, there's no current flow. Therefore, the spark keeps going higher, trying to start current flow. That's what basis that ignition systems work on. They try to create a spark by raising voltage to a point where the spark will occur. We can measure the maximum available voltage by doing an open circuit test. Removing a plug wire from a plug is the old-fashioned way of doing it. With coil on plug now, it gets a little more complicated, but the principle is the same. What's the maximum available voltage? Can be measured. Remember, the voltage is limited by the maximum available voltage. If the demands are too high, a misfire will occur when the voltage required to start the spark exceeds the maximum available voltage. We're looking at around 23,000. If we had an older fish, a bad coil that was only capable of putting out 20,000 volts, we would be 3,000 volts. We would require 3,000 more volts than we have, and we would have a misfire. We would not get a spark. This spark doesn't occur until we pass about 23. 24,000 volts. So if we're looking at 15, 20,000 available, this would be a misfire. So there's a lot going on here. There's a lot to think about. We're going to show you some examples of all of these things when we go to doing the analysis. Now we're going to turn our resistance to the spark. This is the voltage after the spark has started. The voltage is determined by the resistance to the spark. What kind of gaps do we have to jump? Are we jumping compressed mixtures? Are we jumping mixtures with hydrocarbons, which are easier to fire than standard air? Do we have normal spark plug wires? Do we have normal spark plug gaps? All of these things are going to determine this voltage level. Let's talk about this a little more. As we said, this is the voltage drops after the ignition starts, after the spark starts. 3 to 4 kV is typical, and it should be even on all cylinders. Sparking outside the cylinder, where there is no compression and easy to fire, will cause the spark voltage to be lower than normal. Well, that makes sense. This is an example of high resistance. This is an example of a bad plug wire. Bad plug wires have gaps in them in the conductive core material. As you can see, we have a double spark here. We have a little spark starting there, then another one starting later on. Notice what we said before. High resistance causes voltage to be higher. The overall spike is higher than this. Most of these cylinders are running under 10 kV. This one cylinder is running better than 12, almost twice the value of the other cylinders. Why is that? Why are there some that are so low, some that are so high? The answer, resistance. Not all plugs, in this particular case, are seeing the same resistance. The left side of the spark is mostly affected by factors outside the cylinder. That's something to keep in mind. It's where we start the spark. It tends to be outside the cylinder. When the spark stops, the coil oscillations will start. The coil oscillations dissipate the energy remaining in the coil after the spark goes out. Now, the higher the spark voltage when it goes out, 
the more energy that's left. As you can see from these, we have more oscillations in this one than we do the others. There's findings there. These are examples of firing outside the cylinders because of carbon tracking. Notice this is much, much lower than the others. And we have another cylinder over there who starts fine. It's not a bad wire, but something's wrong because it's got a high firing voltage. You begin to see the pattern. A lot of things affect the spike. When we add them to the other clues, the picture begins to form. Take the time to understand everything going on before you jump off the bridge and decide one thing tells you everything. Now, let's go back and look at the length of the spark and the shape of the spark line. This spark tells us a lot. Let's talk about what's there. The length of one and a half milliseconds is typical. That's because the flame front lasts about three milliseconds, and it's ideal to have a flame front for at least half of that. And we always want it to be over 0.9 milliseconds. The length of the spark is directly proportional to the energy in the coil from the primary current and the quality of the coil. And we might add one more thing, and the amount of resistance in the circuit. If we've got a bad plug wire, this can be very small because of the high resistance. But if we have a normal start like this, now we're looking at coil energy from the primary, and we're looking at the quality of the coil. A weak coil with weak output will have a narrow, smaller spark, will not be as wide. If we have primary problems, we don't get full current flow, which puts less energy in the coil, we'll have a shorter spark. So add all these together, and you're going to begin to get a picture. Low coil energy from low primary current, as an example, will cause this spark duration to be too short. Keep that in mind. Short duration can be caused by excessive secondary resistance, low coil energy, bad coil, or excessive plug gap. Anything causing resistance to be abnormally high. But we're going to show you how to divide these resistances. And you've already seen how we look at secondary uh, plug wire problems. Now, a short duration, we should check the call primary current, plug wires, plug condition, and coil conditions in the secondary ignition pattern itself. Remember, we can use this pattern to help identify all of these pieces. That's why we're so big on utilizing this. Worn plugs will cause the voltage spike to be excessively high, over 30 kV, when the throttle is snapped open. That separates bad wires because lean mixtures will not affect a bad plug wire. It's going to stay high. But a wide gap in a spark plug, when the mixture goes rich, goes slightly lean before it goes rich, is going to cause it to jump way high. And this is something we see frequently with dirty injectors and warm plugs, is we see voltages that are uncannily high. And we wouldn't find them any other way than doing the snap throttle test. Now here is a shape. We talked about the shape. Here the shape changes. Look, this pattern shows what happens. When mixture resistance increases, why would mixture resistance be increasing? Well, lean fuel mixtures cause fuel mixture resistance to increase sharply before the spark goes out. We are burning up the hydrocarbons, the conductive, the gas that allows us to ionize easier. It's much harder to ionize air than it is to ionize a mixture. If we're burning up all the fuel out of the mixture, we're winding up with just air. So what's happening is we're getting an increasing resistance. As resistance goes up, look what happens. Higher resistance causes the spark to end early with higher than normal energy remaining in the coil. And the upward slope indicates we have an increasing mixture resistance as we're burning it. Remember, this is burning up all the mixture during the first half of the flame front. We shouldn't be using all the mixture during the first half of the flame front. Typically, the flame front lasts about three milliseconds. Here, we're running out of time. Less than one milliseconds, we're already starting to run out of, out of stuff. We've got two milliseconds per division. We are running out of fuel in one millisecond when we should have a three millisecond frame front. This is the very definition of low power contribution. Now, 
That is a misfire. Low power contribution is classified by the monitor is a misfire. No, we didn't have a total lack of spark, but we did not get full power contribution because of a dirty injector or whatever. Stop and let that settle in. Low power contribution is called a misfire. That's a misnomer, I think, and confuses a lot of people. We tend to have a lot of people say, every time I fix a misfire, it's because of a ignition problem, coil, wires, plugs. Here's a misfire that is not caused by ignition. It's caused by lack of fuel. We want to make sure we take some time to identify exactly how we can see this lack of fuel. Well, first, the first downward spike may be longer when the spark ends early. And the coil oscillations will be larger when the coil ends early. Why is the spark ending early? It's ending early because resistance went much higher. Higher resistance, the spark goes out earlier, leaving more energy to cause the oscillations. That gives us the first spike up higher at the top and the first one at the bottom. All clues, we have lean-out conditions taking place. If all cylinders are lean, check fuel pressure, fuel filter, fuel pump, and things that deliver fuel to all cylinders. But, on the other hand, if only a few cylinders are lean, check the injector and for vacuum leaks in the affected cylinder. Remember, fuel trim adjusts for an average, which will not be an ideal mixture for all cylinders. The cylinder triggering the higher average, if you have one injector, will indicate a much higher value. Now, here's one looking different. Did not start higher, but look at the slope. It's changing. This spark shows changes in mixture resistance all through the firing. Why should mixture be going rich and lean? Could be large droplets of liquid. Bad injectors. But the mixture in a properly sealed chamber should not have large changes if it didn't have big droplets of fuel. Investigate the reasons for these changes. Some of the common things we found is valve problems, sticking, floating, burnt, cylinder head defects, cracks, problems like that, EGR leakage. This particular pattern is off of a 3.8 liter Ford that has a very severe head problem. It has a misfire. It's not fixed by fuel, not fixed by, by uh, ignition. It took a head had to do a head on this particular car. It had severe detonation problem and leaking in the head. Now, EGR, when we have excessive EGR, we'll have excessive hash in the spark line. A little EGR action off idle, 2500 is normal. An excessive amount will cause hash. So now it's time to take all this information we've talked about in generic one at a time and see what we can do in about 10 or 15 minutes to identify as many problems as we can in this set of patterns. And remember, we came here because we have some misfires that show up. Not too good. We've got some problems where the, the misfire monitor can't run. We need to go investigate those. But the real problem the customer is complaining about is the misfire. The one thing we must correct here is a misfire problem because that's what the customer is complaining about. We need to give you some things we find as useful hints. When you start analyzing this pattern with everything here, give the overall picture time to develop before making a final diagnosis. There's a lot of things going on here, and remember, all these things are changing in time and between cylinders. So give it time for it to develop, and you'll find you're much more apt to diagnose. The second big thing we do is what we're doing right here. We record this on our scope, and we play it back frame by frame and take the time to analyze it, just like we're going to do right now. Now, this scope is triggered by number one spark plug and it's triggered on number one. The DIS fires on compression and exhaust. This scope does not separate the firings. 
some very good scopes, like the Snap-on, the Vitronic, the Intero, and some others will give you power and exhaust or wasted spark. Here, we have to interpret them for ourselves. That's the downside. Now, here is the pattern. Look, it's obvious. The red ones across the bottom are number one triggers. This one is higher, bigger than the two on the other sides. These are firing on exhaust. Now, as a hint for you, if I have a bad plug wire, even though I'm on the exhaust where I'm just firing an air and it's easy to fire, the spark line will be much higher on those cylinders. Let me say that again. Bad plug wires on cylinder number one will cause those to be high as well as the one in the middle to be high. So I use that for a diagnostic. I can interpret it that way. So what we're looking at here is a combination of cylinders fired in compression and fired on exhaust. So you need to look at a number of them. We're just going to give you a quick rundown of what we have here. Now, we added a dashed line as a reference for normal spark voltage. We kind of took the average and put that in the middle so we can identify things. But let's see what we find. As we look here, number one cylinder. We're going to analyze this just as a pattern and not try to separate which mode we're in, whether we're on exhaust or on compression or on wasted spark. But look at the oscillations we were talking about. Here, we see oscillations start high, slopes down, with a lot of energy remaining in the spark after it goes out. Starting high, sloping down? Wow, interesting situation here. We're looking at a, the number one cylinder again here. This is number one firing. It's on the wasted spark, and it starts high. Wow, starts high. Did that tell you something about spark plug wires? When it starts high, you got a problem. we got a lot of energy remaining over after it goes out. This is the longer downward spike confirms the large amount of energy after the spark goes out. This can be a lad mixture with a bad wire. We could have bad wire and lean mixture. Here the voltage starts slightly higher, drops down to normal, slopes down, downward slope, and we said tends to be bad wires. And there's a lot of energy remaining. Now, this cylinder is on compression stroke. It is firing mixture. That means we do, in fact, have a lean condition with a possible bad wire here. We're going to go through and analyze a lot of this. Here's one that just kind of starts off flat, goes straight down, has very little energy left over. We want to know. We mark down for mental reference. Why is there so little energy left over in this particular cylinder? The third one after number one in the, in the firing order. We're going to have to investigate that further. Now we're back at the fourth one in the firing order, and we are on compression stroke again. Lots of coil energy. Here is the one we have a misfire on. Starts way high. Lots of energy. Ringing high, ringing low, both ends, we probably have a dirty injector. Starting as high as it does, we probably also have a plug wire. It's not ideal. Now we're back at number one on compression stroke. Starts high with a normal amount of energy reading. What's causing secondary resistance to be so high on these? Guess the plug, right? The wire, I mean. Spark starts high, just slightly high, and slopes down with a lot of energy remaining. Remember, now this particular cylinder is on exhaust stroke. So that's not a bad sign. This one is on compression. It's firing. It's not wasted. Spark starts lower, slopes down with very little energy remaining, and if we look at it, that's a very short spark. Why is there so little energy left over? Again, we have little energy left over. So what happens? Look what happens here. This spark is almost dead. It's a short to ground. This is a carbon arc we found a few years ago. 
and it's showing you that this has a very low spark, which is very much similar to what we're looking at. We've got a very low spike. This voltage spike is lower than all the rest. The rest are off the screen because we put the scale so we can get a good view of all the oscillations and the firings. Why is this spike so low? I got low coil energy, low spike, and if you really look at it, it's got a short spark. Next cylinder. It's on exhaust. It's on wasted spark. Wow, look at that. We're wasted spark. It starts high, stays high. A lot of energy left over. It shows a lot of intermittent uh, fuel injection problems, we think. And then this is repeat of the second pattern on the left. So, repeat of the third. What have we seen at this point? Well, let's go back and take another pass. Let's look at the other half. When we turn coil primary current on, we also get coil oscillations in the secondary. Let's have a look at those. The primary turn-on spike, we call it, the size of the downward spike or oscillations is directly proportional to the primary current flow. Okay, so that tells us how hard we hit the primary with current flow. Let's draw a line down there. That's a good one. Are all the spikes equal? It doesn't take much to look around and see these are not all equal. In fact, we can spot two right here very quickly that are much lower than the rest. The lower down spikes caused by low primary current. These two cylinders are four cylinders apart on an eight-cylinder engine. This is a DIS. This points to one coil not getting the same current flow. Now you begin to see what we're talking about. Give this whole thing time to develop. Notice on the second one on the right, that one has a low spike. The one on the left has a low spike. Both of these have lower spikes than the rest. Going back to telling you what we was telling you before, all this stuff goes to adding up. There's no coil energy left when the spark goes out in these two because there's very little coil energy going in. Now, not only that, but if we look further, we see other things. The coil energy is low. The spike is low. You see how the whole pictures begin to take shape? These two cylinders may misfire during heavy loads. Can't tell at this point, but they're low on energy. Now, what we did in a few minutes, and by the way, there is one more set of coils that have low coil current, not as bad as the two we just worked on. But we're going to have to go look at the primaries. What we found was a connector where the fatigue in the uh, connector wasn't making good contact. The jaws had spread, and we fixed it simply by tightening up the connector pins, and everything was fine. We had two coils causing that problem. But what we saw was bad wires, erratic fuel injection, coil primary problem. One cylinder may not have been firing inside the cylinder in a few minutes. Every one of these problems must be corrected. Our challenge to you is if you don't use secondary analysis, what other technique are you going to use to find all of these? We sometimes people say, well, I'm going to use an ohm meter. Well, the ohm meter could have found the bad plug wires. It would not have found the bad connector with the pins that had been fatigued and widened out, just gotten tired. Why? Because they're going to measure the, the primary resistance of the primary was identical. It was the connector pins. The female was spread out too wide and wasn't making good contact. No other technique we know is going to find all this. How are you going to find the bad injectors? You're going to do a lot more work than we did. And how are you going to find that cylinder that's arcing outside the cylinder, which is arcing down the side of the spark plug? Unless you have to be lucky, you're not going to find it. Yes, there are ignition problems here. Carbon tracking down a plug. There are injector problems. There's wiring problems. 
There's coil primary problems, and we found them all in about 15 minutes. That's why we're so high on this type of diagnosis. What are the tests, as we say, are you going to use to define all of these problems? None we can think of. Now, don't forget, in this thing we're looking at, we have other issues. We have an EGR problem. We have an EVAP. We can easily shift this to the customer and say, Leslie Cochran, do you want to have your EVAP and your EGR repaired at this time, or you want to wait till those turn the check engine light on? Our answer was, no, I just want the misfire to go away. It drives so bad. Okay, when the light check, check engine light comes back on, bring it back to us. We'll fix it. Side note on this story, the check engine light did come back on in a few months. It was for a P125. She had a bad thermostat, but she brought it back for a repair at the shop where we had done this analysis. You need to see what's going on with this crank signal as well. We have something where it's not able to detect misfires because of a problem. Now, are there any other conditions that contribute to a misfire? Look around. Don't ship it just right away. Make sure that EGR can't be a problem. Study the scan data, trouble codes, and freeze frame. We need to look for other information to help ensure that Mode 6 data is current. So this is the type of information we're talking about. This concludes our analysis. We hope that you go over this secondary waveform analysis enough you become good with it. I think we can show you where you couldn't have found the problems any other way.